Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun. And so let's pause right there because the beginning verse of the book of Joshua calls us to glance backward, to look back to the life and the death of Moses, to reflect upon the events of that man's life because we can only clearly understand Joshua in the context of the life of Moses and the work of Moses. Joshua was the successor to Moses, but he was also the one who was the disciple of Moses. Moses was his example. Moses was the man that he sought to emulate. And ultimately, we find that Joshua took up the mantle of leadership from Moses as his disciple, as the one that Moses had prepared and trained. He was an assistant of Moses. If you remember that Joshua was the general that fought the battle in Exodus chapter 17 against Amalek. Moses was up on the mountain. His hands were being held up, and as his hands were held up in prayer, the battle was being won down on the battlefield, but Joshua was the general leading that battle on the battlefield. You remember when Moses was called up Mount Sinai to receive the law of God, the Ten Commandments, it was Joshua who went up the mountain with Moses, didn't go as far as Moses, but he was the one closest to Moses as Moses went up to meet uh, with God on Mount Sinai. He was with uh, Moses there. When the tabernacle was established and the glory of God came down and Moses went into the tabernacle to meet with God, Joshua was there as his assistant there in the tabernacle. And it was Joshua who was the one that God chose to take up the mantle of leadership for the children of Israel in uh, the place of Moses as Moses passed from this earth. And so it was Joshua who was going to be the one that would lead the children of Israel actually into the promised land. Now, as verse 1 calls us to look back at the end and the passing of Moses, let's do that by just turning the page back one page. You'll turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 34. We find the last dealings of God uh, with Moses at the end of his life. Look at Deuteronomy 34, beginning at verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pishgah, that is, over against Jericho. So this is a mountain on the other side, the eastern side of the Jordan River. Uh, Jericho is on the west bank of the Jordan River, but this is a mountain opposite when you look across uh, from Jericho. So he's on that mountaintop that God has uh, led him up to. And it says, The Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, that is the Mediterranean Sea and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and of mourning for Moses were ended. I like what a, a poet has written regarding this burial of Moses here by God himself. Cecil F. Alexander wrote these following lines. By Nebo's lonely mountain on this side Jordan's wave, in a vale in a land of Moab, there lies a lonely grave. And no man knows the sepulcher, and no man saw it e'er. For the angels of God upturned the sod and laid the dead man there. And there was the grandest funeral that ever passed on earth. But no man heard the trampling or saw the train go forth. Noiseless as the daylight comes back when night is done. And the crimson streak on ocean's cheek grows into the great sun. So the point is that no one but God was there and the angels there at the death and burial of Moses. One of the most unusual funerals that the world has ever had. 
where God actually conducted that funeral service. In a sense, what we have here in Deuteronomy 34 is the epitaph of Moses, the last statements about his life. And the curious thing as we read this is, wait a minute, Moses gets to see the promised land, the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this promised land that he'd been moving towards during the 40 years after the Exodus and bringing the children of Israel just to the verge of entering the promised land. And Moses is told, you're not going in. You're not going to go in. You're going to die here outside of the land of promise. And we have to ask our question, why? Why was Moses prevented from doing that? If you keep your finger there in Deuteronomy, turn it back if you would to Numbers Numbers chapter 20. In Numbers chapter 20, we're told why, and this is verse 8 and following. Numbers chapter 20, and look at uh, uh, verses 8 through 12. God is instructing Moses here, and he says, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou Aaron thy, and Aaron thy brother, and speak un ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so shalt thou give a congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear ye now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses failed. Moses sinned in a very, very significant way. And there's three aspects of this sin of Moses that we see here. First of all, notice that he took credit to himself that was due to God for the miracle of the water coming out of the rock. Notice what he said. Uh, he, he said that, must we fetch you, you children of Israel, must we fetch you water out of this rock? It was God that was doing this miracle. But Moses took the glory to himself instead of giving glory to God. That was the first aspect of his failure here. The second notice that he didn't speak to the rock. God said, speak to the rock and water will come forth. Moses took his rod. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock twice and water came forth. And you might well wonder, what, what's the significance of that? Why is that important? One of the things I think we learn here and we should be reminded of, even if we don't understand the whys of God's commands to us, we ought to obey with every detail observed in obeying God's law, even if we don't understand why. It so happens that we're told why it was important for Moses to speak to the rock and not strike the rock in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I won't take time to uh, turn there, but let me just summarize what 1 Corinthians 10 uh, tells us. It tells us that this rock in the wilderness represented the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the living water, obviously. He is the rock of our salvation. And as the rock of our salvation... He was not to be struck by man. He was going to be struck by God when he died on the cross. It was God who brought about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. God struck him, not man. And he was struck how many times? Once. He died once for our sins and therefore striking this rock twice was bringing the wrong message uh, to the children of Israel that God wanted to have communicated to him. Jesus Christ was to be struck once. He was to die once for our sins, not to be struck twice. And that uh, is significant as we think of the application of the idea that Jesus Christ died and his death paid the full penalty for our sins. There's no need for Jesus to die a second time, to be struck a second time. And this is why the endless millions upon millions of supposed re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ in the Romanist mass is unbiblical. They are re-offering Jesus Christ somehow. His crucifixion on the cross was not sufficient. It was not enough. He was struck once, but they want to strike him a million times every day more, somehow thinking that that is going to achieve salvation. It will not. 
It's against God's word. It is an unbiblical concept. Christ died once for our sins. He's not to ever be re-sacrificed. His re-sacrifice, his death on the cross was completely sufficient. It paid entirely, and it's never, ever to be done again. And so for this second reason in, in uh, Moses' sin, he did that which God had not commanded him to do. He violated what God had told him to do. The third thing we see here in Moses' sin is what God said to him. Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. He failed due to a lack of faith. He did not believe God's word. He thought, if I just speak to the rock, nothing will happen. But if I strike the rock, yeah, then something will happen. So he didn't actually believe what God had told him and God had promised him. And so it was his lack of faith here. It was the third aspect of his failure. And this is the reason, God says, that Moses did not get to enter into uh, the promised land. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to remember this principle, that sin, even for us as a believer, always has consequences in our life. Yes, our sins are forgiven. Yes, we're on the way to heaven. And we know, by the way, Moses is in heaven. He is in God's presence. Moses appeared at the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah to speak with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have an assurance that Moses is in heaven. He didn't lose his salvation because of this sin, no. But rather, there was an effect that happened. He lost the opportunity to go into the land of promise. And that is true for us as followers of Jesus Christ as well. When we sin, we don't lose our salvation, but we do have an impact. There is a consequence to our sins that we may live with in this life. Well, let's turn back, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 34 and look at what it states there as well. Some interesting facts are told us that Moses, at age 120, was not diminished at all. His eye was still as clear as when he was younger, and his human strength was not diminished at all. An astonishing thing. Moses lived a life of great contrast. If we look back at his life, he was born as the child of a slave, and yet he was raised as the son of a princess. He was born in a hut, but reared in a palace. Uh, he inherited great poverty of his parents and yet enjoyed immense wealth as adopted uh, son of Pharaoh's daughter. Educated for a court, and yet where did he do his greatest work? He did it in the desert. He was the mightiest of warriors, and yet he was the meekest of all men, Scripture tells us. Moses possessed the wisdom of this world, and yet he had the faith of a little child. His funeral was not attended by a single human being, but the creator of the universe himself was present and actually buried him. Those first 40 years of Moses' life, we know that he was in Pharaoh's palace, and he was in the court, no doubt, learning all the uh, wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians. Many of the researchers into Egyptian education have discovered that the Egyptians had a very vast and extensive knowledge. In fact, one of the uh, uh, archaeologists wrote the book, The Wisdom of the Egyptians, giving us some idea of how large the range of knowledge that may have been acquired by Moses was. For example, the Egyptians studied observational astronomy and instrumental astronomy. They studied arithmetic and geometry and writing and drawing and design. They studied uh, uh, metalworking, metallurgy, and, and agricultural and transport and archaeology. And many, many subjects were part of the training that probably was given to Moses as a member of Pharaoh's household and a potential member of the court system there in the government of, of Egypt. And so he was given the best training that Egypt had to offer in his first 40 years. But what was his second 40 years? He was out on the backside of a desert leading about a bunch of stinky, stubborn sheep. He learned to be a shepherd for 40 years of his life. And all of those, the first 40 years and the second 40 years were actually preparation for his true work in this world that began at age 80 when God called him to go back to Egypt and set the people of Israel free from their bondage in Egypt. It took 80 years for God to prepare this man for the 40 years of work that were to follow. 
80 years before his true life's work began. And that, by the way, should be encouragement to each one of us that at any age, God can and still will use us if we're willing to be uh, his servants. You're never too old to serve the Lord. And it's amazing. God preserved his strength and his eyesight. So at age 120, none of that uh, was diminished at all. So he didn't die of old age or the normal uh, diseases. It was God's choice to say, this is your time, Moses. You've finished your work. I am bringing you home. Now we look at what the children of Israel and how they responded. For 30 days, they mourned and they wept their great leader, uh, Moses. And as we evaluate the life of the children of Israel and his interaction with them, particularly during those 40 years, they were a continual troublesome lot for Moses. They were problems. They were not happy campers, so to speak. Uh, and, and so much so at one point that God said, okay, I've had it with the children of Israel. I'm going to destroy them completely, and I'm going to start a nation out of you, Moses, and you alone. And at that moment, Moses interceded on behalf of the children of Israel in Exodus 32, and God spared them the punishment that he was intending to bring upon them. And Moses did this because of his great love for these difficult people. Maybe more difficult than the sheep he had to deal with on the backside of the desert was the people, the children of Israel. He did so because God directed him. And God used Moses to bring Israel out of the bondage of the land of Egypt. He was also used by God to bring them God's law from Mount Sinai, which is the perfect law of liberty. And God used Moses for 40 years to lead them through their wanderings in the wilderness in spite of their ungrateful hearts and in spite of their grumbling and complaining. In spite of their eagerness to continue worshiping idols, Moses bore with them and Moses sought to lead them to true faith in the one true God. These people really were endless trouble for Moses when we read the account. Yet Moses loved them in spite of that. And he led them just as God commanded him. He was not a perfect man. There was only one perfect man that has ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet Moses was a great and godly leader that the people mourned and truly rightfully mourned when they realized what they had lost in this leader Moses. And so Moses is an example we do well to emulate. And when we study Joshua, we're going to find that that's what Joshua did. He followed in the footsteps of Moses, uh, the one who had discipled him. There's one other curious aspect about the death of Moses and that it was buried and, and no one knows the exact location of that tomb. And it's recorded for us in Jude at the other end of the Bible. If you go to Jude verse 9, just about before, uh, a few books before, just before Revelation actually. Jude verse 9 gives us a very curious statement. It says this, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, we're not told a whole great deal about this, but it's kind of curious that the angel, archangel Michael, had a fight with Satan over the body of Moses and uh, what would happen to his dead corpse. We don't know specifically what this fight was about, but we do have an idea of what Satan was probably up to. Satan was probably uh, concocting a purpose to pre prevent or present a stumbling block to the children of, of Israel to lead them astray, to have the grave site of this Moses become some elaborate shrine that people from all over would come and bow down and venerate and perhaps even worship uh, uh, Moses, perhaps uh, worship the relics of this dead saint rather than worshiping the one true God. And we know that Satan has this plan because we've seen it worked out in other periods of history. Look at uh, medieval Europe, and you clearly see that God uh, uh, was turned aside from and people turned aside for the relics of dead saints and worshipped and honored them rather than the one true living God. So Satan, we know, has that strategy, and perhaps that's why God prohibited the location of Moses' grave from ever being identified by anyone. No one knows where it is, so no one can build a shrine that would lead people astray uh, to worship uh, a false idea rather than to worship the one true God. That may be why God kept uh, Moses' grave a secret even uh, down to our day. 
Now let's go back to Deuteronomy 34 because we notice in verse 9, Joshua is assigned to take up the mantle of Moses. Look at Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. Moses had commissioned him. And uh, the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and in all the mighty, that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Notice the character of a leader here. Clearly, the character of this leader, Joshua, is great because he was filled with wisdom. And he had wisdom, God's wisdom, guiding him. Reminds me of a college professor which uh, once stated about one of his students uh, who was one of the poorer students in his class. The trouble with him is that he does not know that he does not know. You see, the foolish person thinks they know things that they don't actually know. The wise person realizes what they don't know, and they seek the truth. They seek wisdom. Scripture tells us that when we lack wisdom and we recognize that we lack wisdom, we will find it in asking God for wisdom. And you see, Joshua had the same source of wisdom that we have. It is God's word, God's truth. Now, Joshua obviously only had the first five books of the Bible. We have all 66 books, so we actually have more wisdom available to us than even Joshua did. But Joshua was a man who knew God's truth and based his life upon following God's word. In again, imitation of his uh, uh, disciple maker, Moses. And Moses, it says here, there was not a prophet like unto Moses that arose in Israel, but an interesting prophecy was made that there would be a prophet in the future. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. And here Moses is actually speaking and says, The Lord, thy God, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, that is, a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So Moses made this prophecy, but not only Moses, God made the prophecy as well. Slide on down to your eyes down to verse 18. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18. God is speaking here. and He says, I will raise up... Uh, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, he's speaking to Moses, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Who was that one? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who is that prophet like unto Moses who took the word of God as he received it from God the Father and gave it to the world so the world was hearing directly from God the Father when they were hearing Jesus Christ speak. And Jesus even said that. He said, I don't speak anything on my own. I speak what the Father has given me. That's what I proclaim to you. Jesus Christ fulfilled and finished the work that God had given to him. Uh, in his first advent, and in a sense, you can look at the life of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Jesus Christ in his first advent and in his second advent and see they're exactly parallel to the life of Moses. Consider this. Moses was the liberator of the children of Israel. He is the one that led them out of bondage in Egypt. So Jesus Christ is the liberator of us from the slave house of sin, death, and hell itself. Moses by God, was the lawgiver. He's the one that brought the law of God down from Mount Sinai. And we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who gave us the new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you. Moses was also the covenant maker. He's the one that brought the covenant of God and said, you're going to enter a covenant relationship with God. And think of what the Lord Jesus said when he inaugurated the Lord's Supper. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And so Jesus is the inaugurator of the new covenant. He's the lawgiver. He's the liberator. So like Moses, he accomplished that same work. God miraculously liberated Israel from Egypt. And remember how that took place? There were ten plagues that came upon Egypt, one after another after another. 
And then ultimately, when they were even released from Egypt and they were traveling on their journey, then the army of Pharaoh came after to destroy them at the Red Sea. And this is exactly a parallel pattern to what Revelation tells us Jesus Christ will do at his second advent. We've just celebrated his first advent. Remember him born in a manger and, and so on. But at his second advent, we're told he's coming back on a war horse. And he's coming to make war upon the earth. He's coming to bring plagues to this earth. While there were 10 plagues that fell upon Egypt, Revelation tells us there's 21 plagues that are coming upon the face of this earth. Seven plagues that will be uh, the seven seals as each of them are opened. And then seven trumpets will sound. And then there will be seven bowls of wrath that are poured out upon this earth. So parallel to, uh, to Moses, there will be plagues that are poured upon this earth. And then there will be a final battle with the armies of this earth, parallel to that final battle of Pharaoh attempting to destroy the children of Israel. And we're told the outcome of that cataclysmic and final battle, when they, all the armies of this world shall be gathered to seek to defeat the Lord Jesus Christ on the battlefield, and they shall be utterly defeated and destroyed completely. There will be no competition. There will be no armies left in this world when Jesus returns and destroys them. And so what Moses did there at the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh's army is a picture of what is to take place at the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we think of what our Lord did in liberating the people from the bondage of Egypt, we recognize that tyranny, the tyranny practiced by Pharaoh, is what all tyrants throughout the history of the world have done. The problem of tyranny is really the problem of sin. You see, when a civil government steps outside of its God-ordained boundaries that God has laid down in his word, the Bible, that's when tyranny arises. When Pharaoh, like all tyrants, decided to violate God's commands, he did so by stealing from the people of Israel. What did he steal? He stole the fruit of their labor. They were slaves, and so their labor, he claimed, was theirs, and he would steal the entire fruit of their labor, the very definition of slavery. He abused them. He subjected them to cruel bondage there in Egypt, and he also attacked their God-given right to freedom of religion. You remember when Moses first went uh, before Pharaoh, what he told Pharaoh is, let my people go that we may worship and serve the one true God in the wilderness. The implication is we'll come back, uh, but we need to go out into the wilderness to worship the one true God. Pharaoh refused that. He said he would not permit the people to worship the one true God. That he was going to use his power to force them to continue in the tyranny of the idolatry of his society. You remember the idolatry of Pharaoh? The idolatry of Pharaoh was that he claimed he was God. And therefore the people not only were to worship him as God, they were to serve him. They belonged to him. He owned them. They were his property. They were not free and they would not be free. And so in Pharaoh's footsteps is what every tyrant does. A tyrant steals the fruits of your labor. Now in America we don't have perhaps the 100% tyranny of Pharaoh but we have about, a, by many estimates, a 50% tyranny. That is, the average American family has 50% of the fruits of their labor stolen by the federal, state, and local governments. They spend 50% of the year working for their slave master and then 50% working for uh, themselves. And what about the freedom of religion in our land? What about the freedom of preventing Christians from obeying what God commands them to do? forcing Christian Baker to pay $135,000 for refusing to bow down to the modern idol, that modern idol, the latest idolatry of sodomite unmarriage, and, and participating in that ceremony. That's bowing down and worshiping an idol. And our government currently is enforcing a lack of freedom of religion, enforcing the same kind of tyranny that Pharaoh did in his day. When civil government acts in rebellion, and disobedience to God's law. Tyranny commences at that point in time. And we should have seen it coming 50 years ago in America. Christians should have seen this in 1962 when the supreme tyrants took prayer and Bible reading out of the government-run schools. The Christians should have seen the tyranny right then and there and remove their children from those government-run schools and say, we will have no part of Pharaoh's tyrannical education system. They should have seen where this would lead. 
as it clearly did, to child sacrifice. Isn't that what Pharaoh did? He threw the babies in the Nile, let them be killed. Well, we do it by abortion today, but it's the same thing. It's child sacrifice, and it would lead to, as we have seen, sodomy and the promotion of sodomy in our land. That's what happens when tyrants rule. They violate God's law, and they bring about those destructive forces in a society. Eventually, those forces aren't neutral. Those forces eventually attack Christians. And the persecution of Christians who stand on God's law commences because the tyrant cannot stand having someone worshiping the one true God when he demands the idolatry of worshiping him. True Christians stand on the one true law, the law of the universe, God's word. And tyrants always oppose God's law and God's standards. They are followers, tyrants are followers of their father, the devil, and the works of their evil master are what they do. When we look at our country, the future of liberty in our nation today is hanging in the balance. We will see in the days ahead whether we lose liberty entirely or whether it is preserved. And these liberties will be defined by the character of the children being raised in America today. We need a rising generation of true disciples of Jesus Christ who are willing, like Joshua, to fight the good fight of faith. This year, 2017, we recognized and honored the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, that monumental historic moment when a brave young uh, monk named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. He then proceeded to translate the Bible. We were talking about Bible translation and its importance earlier this morning. He proceeded then to translate the Bible for the first time into the native tongue of the German people so they could read the Word of God for themselves. And because of uh, God providentially having the inventing of the printing press preceded that, the Word of God came to the people and the world was soon aware of what God's Word said about everything in life. And this was earth-shattering. In Europe, it changed everything. It touched every part of society from the ecclesiastical running of things to the very peasant begging on the streets were affected by the word of God. Luther, of course, was followed by many other uh, great reformers who uh, they stood on the word of God. They challenged kings. They challenged the religious leadership of their day, declaring sola scriptura, God's word is the standard. God's law is supreme. God's law is preeminent over everything else. And they declared every right, the right of every individual to have the word of God for themselves in the language that they could understood. And so as people began studying and reading God's word for the first time, the hidden truths of God's word became known and God's plan for every part of life became revealed, including God's plan for civil government. And so the Reformation had a direct role in laying the foundation of the Americas because our country was established upon the Word of God. And when our country was for established for the first time in human history since the Hebrew Republic, for the first time since the Hebrew Republic, a people informed by the biblical thinking founded a nation based on the idea of Christian self-government, of liberty under law that is under God's law. And tremendous liberty resulted from that. But the tyrants hate that liberty. Why? Because they hate the God who is the author of liberty. We look at Moses, and we're going to look at, at Joshua in this series. They are great heroes because they stood against the tyranny of their day. They stood upon the law of God and the word of God, and they fought the good fight against the tyrants of their age. They acted based on faith. Turn, if you would, to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, because the faith of Moses as well as the faith of Joshua is directly referred to in this hall of the heroes of the faith. Hebrews chapter 13. Look, if you would, at verses, uh, Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. It says that these, Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. 
But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Quite clearly, Moses and Joshua kept the eternal perspective. They recognized this life was not all that there was, that the eternal perspective was ever before them. And they knew the promises that God had made in his word. Those promises would be fulfilled even if they only saw the partial fulfillment. Moses only got to see the promised land in the distance. He never set foot into that promised land. But they didn't quit, neither Moses nor Joshua. They didn't quit when the going got tough. Why? Because they had faith in the fulfillment of those promises and their faith was unshakable in the promises of God. They knew the God who had made these promises to them and that God would fulfill those promises exactly as he had stated them. Thinking of the promises and that being the connection for our faith, I was reminded uh, several years ago that I read, as I was reading Pilgrim's Progress to my girls, as we were reading together, we read about when Christian and Hopeful lay as helpless prisoners in Doubting Castle, the property owned by the giant called the Spare. And Christian said, what a fool I am, thus to be in this stinking dungeon, when I may well walk at liberty. I have the key in my bosom called Promise. That will, I am persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. Then he pulled out of his bosom and began to try the dungeon door, whose bolt, as he turned the key, gave back, and the door flew open with ease. And Christian and Hopeful both came out, and when they had went to the outward door that leads into the castle yard, with his key, he opened that door also. And after that, they went to the iron gate, for that must be opened too. But that went desperately hard. Yet the key did open it. Escaping from the, by, from the bypath meadow, they went over the stile where they erected a pillar with this notice. Over this stile in the way to, is the way to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair, who despiseth the king of the celestial country and seeks to destroy his holy pilgrim. You see, doubt and despair are destructive for the Christian. They will lock you in a dungeon Faith in the promises of God is the key that will release you from that. And there are many Christians who go through their Christian life spending time as a faithful and Christian did there in Doubting Castle, doubting the promises of God. And they are overwhelmed by the giant despair and they live their lives with despair because they don't believe the promises of God. We need to take those promises, that key of promise, and put it in the lock and release ourselves from the giant castle of doubt and despair. This is what Moses and this is what Joshua clearly did. Now, the legacy of Moses' faith actually began before him. Look on there down at verse 23, Hebrews 11 and verse 23. Notice it says here, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest that he that that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. Notice here, Moses' parents. By the way, you you see here that Moses' parents are pro-life. Yeah, you could put, they they would have a pro-life bumper sticker on their their chariot or whatever. They were pro-life, not just in thought, they were pro-life in action. For three months, they disobeyed the commandment of the civil government, probably on penalty of death, if they were discovered for disobeying it. They disobeyed, why? They knew that God's law is above the law of any human civil government. And when human civil government tells you to violate God's law, you don't obey the government, you obey God's law. The Pharaoh tyrant was about killing all the male children of Israel. Isn't it interesting how Satan seems to have the same playbook 
4,000 years ago as today. Killing babies is what Satan is about, not only then but today as well. They do it today by abortion. In, in Pharaoh's day, they did it by throwing the babies to the crocodiles in the Nile River. But Moses' parents had faith. They believed the promises of God. They believed the law of God. They acted in disobedience to the Pharaoh because they were obedient to God. They trusted in God that anyone that violates the holy law of God is somebody who is not to be obeyed. And so they didn't obey the king. And Moses himself, he followed in his parents' footsteps in the life of faith. He clearly had choices to make. And he made those choices based upon his faith. He could have had a very cushy and very comfortable life in the palace of the Pharaoh for all of his 120 days. He could have had an easy life, but he refused. He sided with God's people, and in doing so, he knew it would cost him greatly, and it cost him everything, literally. He chose the reproach of Christ. He was willing to confront Pharaoh when God sent him back to Egypt. Can you imagine that? He ran from Egypt knowing that Pharaoh was going to kill him if he ever found him. And so 40 years later, God tells him, go back to Egypt to the one who's going to threaten to take his life. And he did. He went back. And he confronted Pharaoh, demanding that Pharaoh let the people of Israel go. And he continued to do this even when Pharaoh threatened him. Pharaoh said, next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. And he did it nonetheless. Why? He believed and had faith in the promises of God. Can you imagine the scene there at the Red Sea? They're in a trap, literally a trap. There's mountains to the north. There's mountains to the south. There's the Red Sea in front of them. And behind them is the army of Pharaoh. And not just any army, by the way. Egypt was the world's superpower of that day. Their army was undefeated on the battlefield. Here's the army of the most powerful nation in the world coming after them with the intent of killing them. And the people were horrified and in despair, but not Moses. He trusted that God had a way out of this trap, what looked like an impossible trap. And so he obeyed the word of the Lord, something that didn't, wouldn't make sense to raise his hand, and the sea parted. And God miraculously sent the people through. But then people got worried as well because they saw the army was following them down into the dry land between the walls of the water. And they thought, oh, we're done anyway, even though God rescued us. And Moses, being the last one out of that, raised his hands and the waters came back and drowned the army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea. Moses simply obeyed what God commanded him to do and look at the powerful, miraculous things uh, that, that were accomplished. You see, when we stand in our day against the tyrannies of our day, against the persecution of Christians in our day, we need to recognize that we're following in the footsteps of Moses, the man of faith, who knew that if he obeyed God, even though things would be difficult, even though things would be painful, it was going to be worked out by God's design to the very best. The problem of tyranny is really the problem of sin. He led Israel out of Egypt by faith in God. And his greatest challenge during the next 40 years was get the people of Israel out of the mindset of Egypt. You see, they didn't have the faith that Moses had. That's why they complained. That's why they grumbled. That's why they gave him so much trouble. They were full of, of uh, faithlessness. And Moses' great challenge was to lead these people to faith in the one true God. They didn't believe God would deliver them. But Moses trusted God even when it seemed impossible and even when it seemed like no one around them was following Ultimately, we know that God took that generation, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, and they all died in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness. They were all eliminated. And it was their children that Moses actually led up to the verge of the promised land. It was their children that Joshua led into the promised land, people who had come to faith in God. Tyranny always results when civil government steps out of its God-ordained boundaries and, and acts contrary to the law of God, outside the restrictions God has placed upon its word. And tyranny calls for men and women of faith to stand up against it, to speak against it, and to walk in the way obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with faith. And it begins when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him as our Lord and Savior. 
the unwillingness of the human heart to rely upon what God does for us was illustrated by a, a, an Irish uh, landlord who owned vast tracts of estates, and he had a, a great number of tenants on his property that paid rent to him. Now, many of these tenants were indebted to him and to others. They, were, uh, they held a, a bills that they could not pay. But this man became a con convicted of his sins, and he became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he placed his faith at, in Christ, he was anxious to make clear to his tenants throughout his properties the truth and the marvelous provision that God had made for them for their salvation. And so he did something very unusual. He caused to be posted throughout uh, his tenancies in prominent places and notice to this effect that on a given day, he would be present at his offices at the uh, gate of the lodge. And from there, from 10 o'clock in the morning until 12 noon, he was going to receive everyone that wanted to have their debts paid off. If they would but come to his office, present their debts, he would pay their debts in full, entirely, clean, nothing left. And for days, the notices were the cause of much excitement in the area of those who were his tenants. People talked about this strange offer, and, and some declared it must be a hoax. That, that can't be true. Others were certain that eh, there must be a catch in here somewhere that we haven't quite caught. He hasn't told us about it. And so they were doubtful as well, even though it indicated that the landlord was good. Some indicated that they thought the landlord must be out of his mind because no landowner in his right mind would ever do what, what this man was doing. Nobody ever heard of a sane man making such an offer as this. Well, when the announced day came, people from all over began to make their way to the office, and the time approached, a great crowd had gathered outside the door of the office. Promptly at 10 o'clock, the landlord and his secretary showed up at the gate. They left their carriage, and without a word, they entered into the office and closed the door. Outside, the great crowd was gathered, and a discussion began uh, being more vehement every minute. Is there anything to this? Did he really mean it? Would he only be making a fool of one who brought in evidence of his indebtedness? Is that what he was about? Some said, oh, no, 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 he's a man of his word, and his signature at the foot of the notices, he would certainly not dishonor his name by doing something that he, uh, opposite of what he promised. Well, an hour passed, 11 o'clock, no one had dared to go into the office to present his claim and his debts. If somebody suggested to someone else, why don't you try it? He'd be met with an angry response. Oh, I don't owe that much. I have no need to go in. Let somebody else try it first, somebody who owes more than I do. And so the precious moments began slipping by. Finally, when it was quarter of 12, an aged couple from the far distant bounds of the estate came hobbling along arm in arm. The old man had a large bundle of bills clutching in his one hand. In a quavering voice, he inquired, is it true, neighbor, that the landlord is paying the debts of all those who come today? Oh, he ain't paid none yet, said one. Well, we think it's just a, a crude joke, said another. The old couple's eyes filled with tears and, oh, I guess it was all a mistake. We hoped that, you know, this was true. We thought that how good it would be to be able to be debt-free before we die. And they were turning away disconsolately when somebody said to them, oh, nobody's tried him yet. Why don't you guys try him? If he pays your bills, come out quickly and tell us so we can come in as well. Uh, to this, the old couple agreed and they timidly opened the door and they were given a, a, a very warm welcome, and they questioned the secretary as if this promise was true. Do you think the landlord would deceive you, said the secretary? Let me see your bills. They were all presented, carefully tabulated, and then a check was written out to cover the full amount of the debts that this couple owed. Overwhelmed with gratitude, the old man and his wife arose to leave, and the secretary said, wait, step, stay, you must be seated. You must remain here till the office closes at noon. Well, they said, well, but there's a crowd outside just waiting to hear the verification uh, uh, of what took place in this office. Uh, but the landlord said, no, no, no. You took me at my word. They must do the same if they want their debts paid. And so minutes passed. And shortly outside, the people moving restlessly about, watching the door, seeing if the old couple would come out, but nobody approached the door to lift the latch. And at high noon, the door opened, and the old couple came out first. Did they keep 
Did he keep his word, the throng asked? Oh, yes. Yes, neighbors, here's the check. It's good as gold, paid in full. Why didn't you come out and tell us? Angrily, many asked them. Well, he said, we must wait inside, and you must come as we did and take him at his word. A moment later, the landlord and his secretary came out, and they hurried to the carriage, and the crowd pressed upon them, waving their handfuls of, of personal bills, crying, won't you do for us what you did for those folks? But as he arose in his carriage, the landlord turned and said, It is too late now. I gave you every opportunity. I would have paid all of your bills in full, but you would not believe me. And then he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, likening the events of that morning to the way men treat God's offer of salvation to the sinner, offer of all the debt that divine justice will call against us. And solemnly he warned each one of the folly of pressing up so close to the great salvation and then waiting till it was too late and the offer was no longer given. Too late to be saved. 